our slideshow. And uh, Farid is on the line with us. He is my, my tech uh, everything. He's brilliant. Farid, let me know if there's anything that goes wrong in this process. But we should be live. Hello, everybody who is live with us today. I'm Sarah. I'm going to be your guide today through the wonderful wild world of my giant green girlfriend, the Statue of Liberty. And uh, I can't wait to show you around. So I've been a tour guide at the Statue of Liberty for a couple of years now. And uh, she's maybe my favorite story to tell uh, because she's equal parts beautiful symbolism and petty, petty nonsense. And I think the petty nonsense actually does a great deal to highlight just how amazing she really is. Because uh, if you think about all the bureaucratic foolery that happened on the way to getting the statue here, it's a miracle that she's here, but she's here for exciting. Uh, but because of the way that I can see my screen, I'm gonna wait to answer all questions until the end of the tour. Uh, but feel free to ask them in the chat windows, or if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, feel free to leave them in the comments as well. I promise I will get to as many of them as I can later uh, at the end of the tour. Um, but we might as well dig right in. I told you a lot about bureaucratic nonsense and petty tomfoolery, and we're gonna spill some tea today. It's gonna be fantastic. So the story of the Statue of Liberty begins with this gentleman, and yes, they are both the same gentleman, just at very different ages, men, uh, who happened to be having a bunch of dinner parties with his friends in 1865. Now, this is relevant to our interest in his apartment and in places all over France. And uh, they're talking about what freedom means, especially in, this, in the fact that their one-time compatriot uh, the United States, who they had done so handily to help liberate. And if you want to know more about that, go to there. But they're very proud of us. You see, end of this, all uh, landowning men have the right to vote now, regardless of their race or ethnicity, which is pretty exciting. Baby steps, right? Uh, plus, you know, he's having this party in 1865. It's not very long before we hit our 100th birthday. Super exciting stuff, right? So they want to give us best birthday present ever because we're best friends with France. In fact, at that one dinner party in 1865, they decided we are really the only best friend to France. Uh, similar in our ideals, similar, similar in our recent revolutionary history. It's very exciting. So they cook up a plan to give us the best birthday present ever. And they fielded a whole bunch of options, but the best one came from this gentleman. And yes, they're both the same man. On the right, he's much younger, uh, standing next to a whole bunch of artistic uh, accoutrements to feel official about it. The portrait on the left is of a... Uh, also, if you have been lucky enough to go to the Statue of Liberty in the past couple of years, you have met a man who looks exactly like that. His name is Glenn. Glenn, if you're watching, hello. I was. Uh, that is Auguste Bartholdi. Now, Bartholdi was a relatively well-known artist at the time, but uh, he was in front of him for a rather large diplomatic blunder he made. Uh, you see that woman on the left? That is a springing light to Asia. She should look familiar, especially with the picture on the right comparing the scale model of the original to what we eventually got. Uh, but progress was supposed to sit on the Suez Canal and symbolize all of the amazing things that imperialism and colonialism have done for Northern Africa. So that didn't play well. Uh, the statue was never built. And it was loosely based off of this gentleman right here that is not what the Colossus of Rhodes would have looked like, by the way, he would not have been wearing underwear. Um, it's actually rather appalling. But this was one of the original great wonders of the world, one of the ones we no longer have. And uh, he wanted to create a new Colossus, which gave him this idea. But Egypt didn't want 
a new colossus. And they didn't want a reminder of the burden of imperialism on this ancient noble civilization. So they, they decided they didn't want the statue. That's when he offers the idea to my friend, Edouard de Laboulier, who was not thrilled at the idea of getting sloppy seconds from this artist, but uh, eventually came around to the idea that maybe this was a pretty, pretty cool gig. Plus, we could always rename her in the ideal of Liberté, the uh, French slash Roman uh, goddess figure representing that beautiful ideal of freedom. So we rename her Liberty Enlightening the World from Progress Bringing Light to Asia. And uh, that is when shenanigans begin. He eventually got a whole bunch of people involved, including this gentleman. This is Violet Le Duc. Now, he was a mentor and a, uh, a friend and compatriot to August Bertoldi, and he became the lead engineer on the project. You might recognize his face if you've seen recent restoration pictures from Notre Dame. He was also in charge of restoring that church and a number of the uh, statues that used to be all over the spire that unfortunately burned down in that fire. They're safe, they were in for restoration then. Uh, St. Thomas of Aquinas, his statue is actually a self-portrait, which, you know, gotta love a man with self-confidence. Um, so the two of them start working together on making the statue happen. But if I can quickly scroll back here, there's a lot of changes that have to happen first because that woman on the left is holding the statue with her left hand, super insulting. Uh, the left hand is the devil's hand at this point in history. The idea that people wouldn't be trained out of being left-handed in the Western world is a relatively recent development to the point where I'm sure that some of the people on this call uh, had nuns hit them on the wrist at some point in their lives for writing with their left hand. But there's also the small matter of, take a look at that clay right there. That is a much more curvaceous woman and much thinner fabric of a dress than we're accustomed to seeing on the Statue of Liberty. Uh, there was a lot of toning down that had to happen in order to make the statue family friendly. Uh, even today, American standards for what's acceptable for children to see are way stricter than France's are. Um, there's a lot more permissible uh, body revelation, if you will, in Europe than there is in America today even. So we had to cover her with more fabric, strip away any notion that this guy was, uh, that this statue was based off of Bartholdi's girlfriend, cause she was. The wife hated that. I told you there was tea. But once we finally had all of the elements of her statue ready to go, we had her tablet in her left hand replacing broken chains that a number of the wealthier donors to the project were a little worried would incite a uh, progressive labor riot. Um, we have her torch in her right hand, carrying us with light into the world. We also have a literal interpretation of liberty enlightening the world with that crown emitting rays of light, seven of them, because the number was pretty. Now, the Parks Department will tell you that it's for the seven seas and seven continents of the earth. I think that's really cute. And I really like that idea. Probably not true because, uh, Seven seas and seven continents is a very American description of global geography. The French would not have probably pictured it that way. Also, uh, we have no record of him ever talking about seven seas and seven continents with seven rays of light. But I really like the idea. So we're going to retcon it. We're going to go with it. Seven seas, seven continents, enlightening the whole world. So we know what she's finally going to look like after several years of back and forth between the organizing committee in Laboulier and uh, Bartholdi and uh, Violette Le Duc organizing the actual design of the piece. Now, Violette Le Duc dies in the 1870s with no notes for how to attach the statue to an eventual stone base, which is kind of a problem because the statue is only three eighths of an inch 
no, three thirty seconds of an inch thick, about a penny and a half in in thickness. So, you know, we need some pretty sturdy attachments to get her stuck to that pedestal when we eventually build it in the United States. And that's where this gentleman comes in. This is Gustav Eiffel. You might know him from his more uh, famous construction, the Eiffel Tower. And this is relevant because the Eiffel Tower is basically what he built inside of her. She was the first ever actual practical piece of his work to have that system of a uh, trust triangulated thin lightweight steel beams holding up a lot of weight it was his way of proving that the eiffel tower would work so you could kind of say that they are sisters from across the sea uh shout out to all of our paris guides doing the good work over there hi linda um but now we finally have this system which actually sits just inside of the skin, attaching to all of the pieces of her and attaching her then into the stone and concrete of the pedestal. We need to put her together. And uh, by the way, this beautiful visual right here, you can kind of see the Eiffel Tower in her. And those stairs, they are as steep as they look. I did it when I was like seven. My legs were jello for a week. It was hellish. Uh, but all of that was attached between the skin and the, the inner structure with these bars. It's not the clearest picture. I couldn't really find one that was, you know, uh, safe for reuse that was much clearer than this. But you can kind of get the sense that those are old cast iron bars. They used to sit inside the skin of the Statue of Liberty, fitting perfectly to everything. It kind of gave her the flexibility to move around in the breeze without cracking, which was super important because she's a giant hollow woman in the middle of one of the windiest harbors I've ever been in. But those cast iron bars aren't inside of her anymore, as you can probably tell from this recent photograph of them lying on the ground. They've been replaced with stainless steel, which is so important because that steel is what gave her the flexibility to wiggle around quite a bit more during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, for those of you who weren't here for that, you might recall seeing on the news that there were large chunks of Brooklyn and Staten Island that were devastated by the hurricane. Uh, it was about a week before my hometown got enough uh, power and cell service back for me to be in regular contact with my family. So you can imagine what it was like on Liberty Island. The steel held together way stronger and way more durably than this cast iron would have, considering the iron was in her, exposed to the elements for about a hundred years before we did a renovation to switch her out. Uh, so. That's a fun little bit of a reno history for all y'all. Uh, but it's finally time to build her. We know she's gonna be pretty massive and we know she needs to stay relatively light, which is why we did what you see here in this workshop photo. So this workshop had a multi-step process called repoussé in order to build the statue. She wasn't the first to be built in this way, but she was by far the most impressive at the time. Uh, what you start with is these wooden molds. You can see them working on one of them in the foreground right here. Uh, those wooden molds were uh, put together and covered in plaster. So you have this giant statue in plaster and wood. That's obviously not what we want to put in the harbor. We build other molds on top of that plaster fitted to the shape of the plaster, flip those over, and that's what we heat and hammer our Norwegian copper into until it's nice and smooth. Do that, you know, 300 more times and you have a full scale statue all the way from head to toe. It was an incredibly labor intensive production and it took 11 months for the five dozen people who are working on this site to do this, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. It was a very intense process. Uh, and it was very expensive. So of course we had to get on raising money right away. 
Now, the first piece of the statue that was constructed was actually the torch. It was finished in 1876, way before the rest of the statue was put together. And Bartholdi took it on tour in the United States to help garner some, uh, some very specific um, donation money from wealthy elites, from cities. Uh, he would eventually extend that to a full train tour of the United States, taking it from state to state on trains in pieces to get the last of the money together. And I have this picture in completely the wrong order. So forgive me, my friends, but that is the torch. Terrifying, right? God, it gave the children nightmares. Plus, it was coming to the States in the 1870s, in the middle of what we used to call the Great Depression before, you know, 1929 happened. So they were putting this in Madison Square Park, right next to the former Madison Square Garden. And uh, everyone around there was looking out there at a reminder that they didn't have any money to give to this fund. So that didn't work out pretty well. Uh, it will be a long time before we finally raise the bulk of the money to build the statue in the States. But around this time, he's also helping to drum up support through founding the American Committee for the Statue of Liberty, which featured a 19-year-old Teddy Roosevelt, who would later become governor of New York and president of the United States. And this committee was in charge of drumming up support, organizing logistics, all of that fun stuff for when the statue did eventually arrive in New York in the 1880s. Spoiler alert, we didn't get it done in time for the 100th birthday, so there goes that. But we, uh, one of the more successful elements of Bartholdi's frequent, actually frequent American trips to the States was getting President Grant in his last day in office to sign an order saying that the President of the United States has the authority to accept the Statue of Liberty and to pick where it's gonna go, which is how it eventually ended up on Bedloe's Island. Now, today we call this Liberty Island, but it used to belong to a Dutch family by the name of Bedlou. And there's some drama here. It is federal property, all federal property. But it's a little pocket of New York inside of New Jersey. Because in the 1660s, we decided that any island in New York Harbor that you could sail around in less than a day was small enough that we could tack it onto New York, which was already a really prosperous city when it was taken over from the Dutch by the British. So all of the small islands were gonna go to New York, the big ones were gonna go to New Jersey. And if you were watching our Revolutionary War tour, we had a fun little discussion at the end of that about the wild hijinks that managed to wrangle smaller island, way smaller. You can easily sail around in a day. So this became part of New York colony. When the states eventually happened, they divided New York's uh, Hudson River between New York and New Jersey, and then split the harbor. And this is on the wrong side of the harbor, but it's still New York. And why do I know that? Because we're constantly fighting over custody of the island for tax purposes. So that's a whole thing. But anyone who ever doubted me on that, because I know I've got plenty of family on this call, and I know I have bored you to death with this story, but if you ever wondered if I was lying to you, look at this. This is a screen cap I took off of Google Maps about an hour and a half ago to prove to you this is still a thing. But uh, Bedloe's Island was an obvious choice. If you look at where that northern dock is pointing, where it says New York above and New Jersey below, that's pointing in the direction of New York. And the Statue of Liberty standing where she is faces out into New York Harbor and the Atlantic Ocean. And New York is the gateway to the world. We have more immigrants than any other city in the States in terms of who comes, who stays, how many ethnicities and religions and languages we have represented. We really are the melting pot that, uh, that America prides itself in being. 
that is who we are. I am broadcasting to you right now from Forest Hills, Queens, the most diverse county in the United States, which carries on that legacy. So of course, if we're gonna have a statue welcoming people into the States, she has to be looking the right way. And this was the perfect spot. So that's how they picked Bedloe's Island. But, and I promise we will get to those other slides soon. Uh, this is a fun little picture that uh, they took during construction of her face. Now, I much prefer my picture taken more recently. That is the face of the Statue of Liberty. I don't know how the scar on her nose happened. It was a terrible mistake on somebody's part. No one has been able to explain it to me adequately. So that's a mystery that's gonna stay with us forever. But uh, you might notice something interesting about the metal here. It's not green, or at least it's mostly not green and only starting to go right across her freckle line because the statue built of copper was not pre-treated like a lot of our copper roofing is today. She was originally intended to be as shiny as a brand new minted penny. Over the course of about 20 years, she got to that mint green color that we're so accustomed to, and that's actually built up on top of her skin. You can think of it kind of like as if she's wearing sunscreen that also has immuno uh, bolstering properties to it. It protects her from harmful UV rays, any debris that might be in the air, any chemicals that might be in the air, a stray seagull claw, and God knows we have enough of them over there. They're terrifying. Uh, it keeps her safe. We've thought about scraping her back down, but it would be too expensive, too labor intensive, and you know, we like her being safe and there's plenty of green stuff already selling like hotcakes in the, uh, in the gift shop. So, you know, we're not gonna get rid of the good thing. But the workshop pumps out all these beautiful copper panels and you can see in a seam down her brow where it's kind of revealed how she was put together in sheets that were all put together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, now it's time to send her off to the States, but we're having trouble because America was not ready for their end of the bargain at all. And it all comes down to this pedestal and this man, drama queen extraordinaire, Richard Morris Hunt. And I feel like I'm allowed to say that because I had my senior prom in a building he built in Port Washington, New York uh, for the Oh God, of course I'm blanking on the names now. But if you've ever been to the Sands Point Preserve, uh, the former Hempstead House area, uh, it's a beautiful county park and it's the former home of the Gould family. That's the name, the Gould family and the Guggenheims. And he actually built a castle for the Goulds that they never lived in because they sold the property immediately to the Guggenheims. And now it's a catering hall. And hopefully when this is all over, it'll go back to also doing concerts. But uh, he is known for his flair. You might know him from the much more famous Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Fifth Avenue facade was his construction as well. Uh, he knows how to make stone look good and he does not know how to work on a budget. So this that he planned for us was actually like the fifth proposal that he had for us. Everything else was way too tall, way too grand, way too expensive. We had to knock his expectations down a couple of pegs as to what we were willing to commit to. Uh, we eventually signed off on this on the notion that it was only gonna cost us $40,000. <laughs> what a laugh, 120K, about, in 1880s money, uh, which is about, it's somewhere in the range of 80 to a million dollars, uh, 80 million to a hundred million dollars today. Uh, so not the most expensive construction project New York has ever seen, but still not cheap and in the middle of a depression. So how are we gonna raise money? Well, we tried the torch thing, that didn't work. Uh, we tried having concerts and selling like souvenir bottles of wine for the fundraising committee. None of those worked either. Uh, eventually we had to turn to this notion, which did not make anyone happy. Uh, can you imagine if we had corporate sponsorship for the Statue of Liberty? This was a uh, political cartoon released in the 1880s 
as a response to that notion. But while we're on this picture, before we get to the man who saved the day, I want to point out to you a sketchy little detail. Uh, to her left, our right. See that? That is the Brooklyn Bridge. It's also the only bridge in that sketch because it was the first bridge that ever connected Manhattan to the rest of uh, New York. And this is a big deal because it was finished three years before the Statue of Liberty opened and set a lot of important precedents for how large construction sites like this are to be run. Um, also, they had a way higher death count than the Statue of Liberty's construction sites. So not only did they learn from the successes, they also learned from the failures of that project. But clearly, this isn't gonna work. I'm not about it. Uh, sure death cigarettes is a terrible thing to have on a skirt, unless you're going for a hipster ironic thing. But thankfully we didn't have to resort to this because this gentleman came along. That is Joseph Pulitzer. Now Pulitzer was a, a Central European immigrant who came to the United States in the 1860s and who uh, overcame tremendous adversity in order to be able to become the most important man in journalism history, arguably. You might know him as the villain from Newsies, but we gotta give him a little bit of slack. Uh, he certainly wasn't the only person abusing his, uh, his entry level workers, especially children, uh, which is a terrible way to excuse labor abuse. I am so sorry. But uh, he did do a tremendous amount of good for New York City. He gave us the New York world in all of its glory, which existed before, but he made into a household staple. Uh, he kind of set the precedent for national journalism as well. And he gave us a beautiful fountain outside of the Plaza Hotel, with, uh, which he bequeathed to us uh, in his will, which is fantastic. We like him a lot. He also is an immigrant. He actually jumped ship in Boston when he was coming to the States after he found out that his sponsor was going to press gang him into uh, slave labor in a sweatshop. So that's fun. And he roamed around the country for a little bit before finally settling in New York and making his fortune here. He knows the American dream inside and out, and he knows what immigrants coming from the Atlantic are going to want from their experience and what they'll need to assure themselves they made the right choice when they get to America. So he wants to make the statue happen. That's his mission. So he decides he's gonna use his newspaper for good. He puts together this huge fundraiser saying, hey, everyone, if you wanna make the statue happen, I do too, throw any amount of money at me. I'll give the address and give a note with that money and I'll make sure the note may, ends up in the front page of my newspaper. Now, for a lot of people, this would have been the first time they had ever seen their name in print. And this was available to people regardless of their income level and what they were willing to spend. So people donated pennies, nickels, dimes in order to make this happen. Two of my favorite stories. There was a dollar thirty-five donated by a Hoboken classroom of kindergartners. So 25 students and their teacher and teacher's aide all together, $1.35 to this fund from this tiny little classroom in Hoboken. And there were two boys who each gave 25 cents, would have been a month's wages for them at their factory jobs, just so that they could help make sure that this statue was there waving ready for their mom when she was coming over from Sicily because they were also paying for her passage. So this really was a great leveler all of a sudden, everybody could be in the newspaper and you didn't even have to break the law to do it. It was amazing. So this is how he raised over $100,000, more than making up the deficit on America's side, which means we can build her. Now, it takes about 11 months to build her. And in 1886, for our uh, 110th birthday, we finally celebrate. And you can see all these gorgeous steamboats in the harbor that were there for the big unveiling. Uh, they actually had a sheet in front of her face that they dropped on cue, uh, but they got the cue wrong, which is kind of embarrassing. Cut off a Frenchman like an hour before his speech was supposed to be over, but also an hour for a commemoration speech, he was overdoing it. So it's fine. We had a great time. 
There were tons of ships out on the harbor to watch it. There were invited guests, about a thousand invited guests that were able to go to the statue and be on Bedloe's Island for the unveiling, uh, which was inaugurated by Grover Cleveland, so a couple presidents later. Uh, and it was also our first ticker tape parade because all those officials had to go from City Hall down to Battery Park to get on the boats, to get to the statue, to do the ceremony. And uh, a whole bunch of stockbrokers that day were a little bit annoyed that they couldn't go visit. They also had a whole bunch of trash lying around. You can see on the right there, there's a stock ticker machine that's uh, pumping out all sorts of stock information on it. This is one of the fancier ones. It, hooks up to a telegraph or telephone line and gives you all the information you need to know if you're trading stocks or need that information and you're not on the stock market. And it produces a lot of waste. And garbage removal in New York is expensive. My God. Uh, remind me, somebody send me an email, remind me that I want to do a session like this about the Mobro incident someday soon, because that is a trip. But uh, they have all this garbage lying around. They're saving it up for a bulk discount, putting it out only on garbage days. So there's paper lying everywhere and they can't go outside and they wanna get rid of their garbage bill. So what do they do? They throw the paper out the window and thus the ticker tape parade was born and we've been having them ever since in New York. The most recent one was for the 25th, no, 2019. Women's World Cup Championships. And the one before that was for the 2015 Women's World Cup Championships. So they're doing pretty well right now. This picture obviously is not from the, uh, the inauguration of the Statue of Liberty. Those are very modern cars in it, but we don't have any photographs of the first ticker tape parade because nobody knew it was gonna happen. So nobody had a camera ready. But uh, we finally open up the Statue of Liberty. She's ready to go. Uh, about 100 years later, 80 years later, 80 years later, she goes on the Registry of National Landmarks and she becomes a national park, officially putting her under the purview of the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service, who still maintain her to this day, with a little bit of help from the Save Ellis Island Foundation, who got together a whole bunch of money for a new museum for her recently. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go visit. But one woman who never got to visit that I want to tell you a little bit about. Do I have this slide? I hope I have this slide. There we go. Okay. So this is the New Colossus, written by Emma Lazarus, who was a prominent poet and labor rights activist and suffragette in the 1870s and 1880s. Unfortunately, she never got to see the statue in person because she was bedridden in her apartment in Greenwich Village when the statue opened with uh, what they then diagnosed as um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So she didn't really get to do much of anything besides write this poem. But as a daughter of immigrants from, uh, at the time, the unwanted classes, so we're talking Russia and Eastern Europe, she knew how important this was going to be to the people who could never afford to donate money to this fund. So she wrote them a poem to help uh, inspire a sense of pride in this and raise more money from the people who could donate. And it features her most famous lines, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And I think that's the most important part of the statue for me that, uh, yeah, she started out as a whole bunch of wealthy intellectuals celebrating freedom and an alliance between two nations, uh, but, She's also from the beginning represented America at its best. People coming together from all over the world, from all different circumstances to make this happen. Not just the Statue of Liberty, but also everything that she represents. But uh, never fear, Emma was not forgotten. You probably know this poem. I know as a Girl Scout, I had to learn it for several badges. Um, but the poem itself is immortalized in this bronze plaque that was originally put outside the Statue of Liberty in 1903 for the 20th anniversary of the poem's publication. It is now safely inside the museum so that it can survive the elements a little bit better. Um, and it's the most published piece of literature about the Statue of Liberty and one of the top 10 most published poems by any American poet. So yeah, she kind of got her due. But uh, 
now that we have her story from beginning to end, let's give you a little walkthrough of what she looks like now. Uh, she's about 151 feet tall from the top of her torch to the bottom of her feet. Um, she's 305 feet and six inches from top to bottom of the whole structure from the fort that she was built on top of through the pedestal to the top of the torch. Uh, she weighs about 450,000 pounds, which is pretty light for a 31 story tall woman. That's pretty decent, but uh, she's entirely hollow and incredibly thin, like I mentioned before, uh, situated right here on the easternmost point of formerly Bedloe's, now Liberty Island. And uh, that is a view from her torch. I wanted to make sure you guys saw that. There is actually an earth cam up there so you can see a live stream and watch all the birds fly past her and everything. I wanted to show you this because none of you have seen it before in person and I know that because there is nobody old enough for that. Uh, none of you were here for that because the statue actually closed down its torch in 1917 after it was nearly knocked off by an explosion in nearby New Jersey. Uh, so this is a great way to get that perspective without endangering yourself on that incredibly precarious uh, observatory level. Super important, stay safe guys, it's, it's scary. Uh, but the inside of her head looks a little bit something like this. Now you might've noticed all those beautiful finger waves she had going on in her bun. Uh, that's what that looks like from the inside, which just shows you how thin it is. That's not chiseled out of the metal or built up on the metal. It's so thin that they had to make the whole thing do that. Um, and that is, I actually don't know that uh, park ranger. This must have been taken more than five years ago. If anybody knows that park ranger, let me know. I want to give him a shout out because he looks Fantastic in this picture, doing the good work, taking care of the place. Now the man who's currently tasked with taking care of the place, I actually don't know who that is because the man who was there when I was working there before the shutdown is named Louis. And he's supposed to have retired this month. So happy retirement, Louis. Uh, I hope it treats you well. Don't be a stranger. Uh, we love you, but uh, this is an example of the difference that I was talking about between her copper and her green. Uh, this is proof that I'm not going crazy. These both are images that were generated during the original uh, fundraising push. So that was her original intended color. And this is what happens when you let bureaucracy have a little bit too much fun. The torch on the left is the original. That was put up in uh, 1886, but it is not the original design. The original design is on the right. Uh, the left is a concession to the Department of the Interior and the Lighthouse Commission who wanted to make her functional. But you might notice uh, there isn't a lot of glass surface area there and the light bulbs are not particularly strong. They wouldn't have had anything strong enough to do the job back then in such a tight space. So she was a terrible lighthouse. Fantastic woman, terrible lighthouse. So when the torch was, uh, when we were doing renovations anyway in the 1980s, we took the torch down, replaced it with the original design, which you'll see on the right. Uh, that's what's up on her arm currently. And this is photographic evidence of that very same adjustment. But uh, to talk a little bit about what's happened since she's been built. The Statue of Liberty has come to represent a great many things. And though I know you're muted, I can hear my Uncle Tim in the back of my head laughing at the Levi's ad. Uh, some of the symbolism that she's been coming, has come to represent is really noble. Some of it is entirely commercial, like her not wanting to put her arm up because her pit stinks, so she's a deodorant ad. Oh boy, uh, some of it has been really ridiculous. Uh, some of it, has been really wholesome. Like, uh, I mean, partially commercial, partially really sweet feeding the world, uh, but also the ad that was created 
saying that the Statue of Liberty would be proud of you if you uh, didn't have a whole bunch of litter lying around. In the 1970s, they put together this ad campaign to encourage people to put their garbage in trash cans because 1970s Manhattan was disgusting. But these are my two favorite things that she's come to represent. Now, I know the ad on the left seems a little scary and a little bit xenophobic, uh, and that's because I couldn't find a high enough res uh, resolution image of this ad, which is actually an ad for the Peace Corps. I love this campaign. Um, this was telling everybody, hey, you want to make America a greater place? You want to make it someplace where you want to live? Well, you're not going to stop other people from showing up here. This is the land of opportunity. So if you want them to be equipped to do so, so that we can all work together to build a better country, you've got to go over to where they're coming from and help out, help distribute food, help create irrigation systems in arid land, help, uh, help distribute vaccines to kids in third world countries who don't have access to them, distribute health care, uh, improve literacy and financial literacy for budding entrepreneurs in those countries. That way, as you see on the right, when they do come to America, they're ready for everything we're going to throw at them and everybody will be on the same page. That is how you make America a greater place. And I think that's absolutely beautiful as the granddaughter and great granddaughter of immigrants myself. I know that's very much what she's come to represent for me too. Uh, but there is uh, also the small matter of New Jersey. Now I rag on New Jersey a lot, I do. Cause I'm from Long Island, we have to. But I wanted to show you guys these pictures since we are about to leave the Statue of Liberty behind, we're coming to the end of the tour in our question section. Uh, I figured that we would, you know, see a little bit of her from behind as well as she moves into a more democratic future. These pictures were all taken from New Jersey by my dear friend and colleague, Ebeth. Hi Ebeth, I love you so much. Thank you for these pictures. She lives in New Jersey and she sent me these beautiful photos from a walk that she had recently and also a slightly older one, I'm guessing, from the activity in that park in the bottom left picture. Uh, but you wanna see what the statue, uh, so we know why the Statue of Liberty is important to me as a symbol. I just wanna close out with why she's important to me as a workplace. Uh, it is easily the most fun job I've ever had giving tours of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, so much so that if you look on the bottom right, that's a picture of me and my friend Patch. Hi, Patch, if you're watching. Um, from when I went there on my one day off that month to show him around on my free time. I am obsessed with this place. Uh, I have learned from some of the best tour guides in the business, including Bottom Center, my friend Remy, who is showing off the best technique to get a picture with the Statue of Liberty have the tour guides uh, lie down on your back. And uh, I've met some amazing people. That gentleman, Louie, that I mentioned, the keeper of the flame, that is him in the park rangers uniform in the top right. Uh, and I've had some amazing guests, like my friend Ryan in the bottom uh, left who came on a tour with me and the lovely family who brought their American Girl doll along to take pictures with her flat Stanley style. Uh, it's the best workplace in the world. And if you wanna hear more about that, cause I won't yammer on about it today, come back next week where I'll have a bunch of amazing guests and we'll give you all the inside gossip about what it's like to work there. Uh, but I wanna thank you all so much for coming along. I'm gonna take questions right now and I'm gonna leave this slide up just in case anybody is inclined in that direction. Uh, this is a free tour. Gratuities are by no means uh, obligatory at all. But if you feel like it, you know, groceries are expensive and they're getting more expensive by the day. Uh, that link is available to you should you so choose. And I will be putting it in the chat as well. Uh, but I am going to figure out, okay, now I can see everybody's uh chats oh may says oh my may i want to know more about that um but i would like to unmute everybody who is on this call 
so that we can, uh... I'm there we go. I am unmuting. I'm gonna unmute everybody. My friends, actually, no, everyone on this call right now is my family, I believe. Uh, so, uh, family, do you have any questions? Can we wait? I uh, don't know. Can we? I'll start the if I can. How do we wait? Start the video. There we go. Well, I can hear you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Great do job. You guys have questions. Also, thank you for the for the suggestion to do this one. Oh, this is awesome. We love this. This is awesome. Very good. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I can't wait to take you back there in person when it's uh, safe I can't to do wait to see it. This is yeah. great. I'm on the floor in a, Hi. In a bad spot. So. <laughs> Claire, that's okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi, May. Hi. So do you have any questions? How many stairs is it? Oh, is God. it hard to do? Uh, How long does it take? Would, so I it's to, would I be able to walk up it? <laughs> oh, you would have to. Uncle Bruce, you would have a lot of treadmill walking to do so beforehand. And I know that because I would too. Uh, oh. It's slick. So it's 215 uh, steps up from the ground level that you get into at the bottom of the fort all the way up to the uh, the top of the pedestal. And was that a picture of the stairs? Like they're that windy and steep? Yes. Okay, yes, that's a no are. for me. <laughs> now, and the, the double helix that you saw, yeah. that isn't one set of stairs that goes up and then there's another one that goes down elsewhere. Okay. So the stairs you saw that woman going up, the stairs right above that are actually the steps going down. Wow. That's why the steps are so steep. That's why there's only about 164, 165, something around there, steps from the bottom of the statue itself to the top of the statue itself. Wow. In addition to the 215 that you took to get to the top of the pedestal. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> So just to get to the top of the pedestal, is there an elevator? <laughs> uh, to the top of the pedestal, there's an elevator. If you have to I use know, the Bruce elevator- I know, Bruce, get on the elevator. Don't yeah. do If it. you have to use don't the don't elevator- <laughs> So that's mom saying, don't do it. Because <laughs> we did it together right before, actually right before 9-11. When so you go up then, the stairs, when you go up that last spiral, the person in front of you's butt is on your head. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> It's bad. It's a little easier now. Um, we went, when, when uh, my mom and uh, my cousin Aileen and I went, it was right before 9-11, which is not to make a 9-11 reference. It's to say that security was a lot looser back then. Yeah, they, everybody could go up to the statue's crown. And that meant it was very crowded. Uh, so it was, you know, take a step, wait, take a step, wait, take a step, wait for a couple hours. You got yeah, five seconds hours. at the top of the- uh, Hours, but you didn't get winded. Yeah. Taking one step. So in this case, the elevator is probably faster. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you, well, nowadays not so much because since 9-11, they've clamped down a lot on security. Uh, the pedestal only, uh, when it's open, only about 2,000 people are allowed to go up to the top of the pedestal. Only 50 people an hour are allowed to go up to the top of the crown, and you've got to pre-register for that sometimes up to six months in advance, and you got to go through a background check to do it, too. Uh, it's very intense. So it doesn't take as long anymore, and there are little areas where you can pull over and rest, which is really important because occasionally somebody will get a panic attack because they're claustrophobic or afraid of heights because it's a giant hall woman and uh, EMTs have to come get them. That'd be hard. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it's a little easier to do in terms of logistics, but that also means that, you know, you are going to get winded in the process if you don't regularly sprint up mountains, um, basically. So it's a little tricky to deal with, but. All right. Um, oh, but yeah, and, up there, I should be looking over here. It's up yeah. to you. Okay. Have it's you, whatever yeah. you want to do. <laughs> don't mind me, I'm very non-Zoom, Zoomy. That is so okay. So yeah, that's, that's what you're looking at if you decide to take the climb once it's uh, safe and open to do so. Well, Which know. probably won't be for a while because yeah. that won't be happening in New York until uh, phase four. Which is like and August, then, I think. Yeah, maybe September, yeah. Um, depending on how well the earlier ones go. 
tourism is rough right now. Yeah. Uh, and phase four is when they're finally going to open up the docks in New York again, which means that we'll be able to run boats again. So even if the National Park Service doesn't open up right away, it's likely that you'll still be able to take a boat to go and visit, to go around the island to see it. Those cruises will probably open up with phase four before the Department of the Interior gets around to restaffing all their furloughed. Uh, wow. Project. Yeah. Wow. I got a question. I have an answer, Uncle Tim. Okay. What's up? <laughs> you said that the arm, the, you know, that the torch was closed because of an explosion in New Jersey. Yes. What was the explosion? Oh, I'm so glad know you know asked. The things, things that happen in Jersey are crazy. <laughs> yes, they are. I and I say that Jersey, with much love for New Jersey. Jersey. I said it with much love for New Jersey. I could never survive in New Jersey. I have so much respect for New Jersey. <laughs> but <laughs> so actually, this is really interesting because it has an interesting interplay with our family history. And uh, was it me? Not, you know, it wasn't <laughs> us. But uh, but it's always interesting to me that the generation in our family that stopped. Uh, fluency for the family in German, this kind of coincides. Uh, see, the Black Tom Island in New Jersey, which was, a, uh, ha was built up from being a tidal sandbar, um, was a major artillery base for the American army and arms manufacturers. And at the beginning of World War I, a lot of Americans, especially in the Northeast, did not want to enter the war because 35% of Manhattan spoke German at home. So we don't want to blow up our cousins in a war that none of us started. So there, were, there was a lot of anti-war sentiment in New York and in New Jersey uh, regarding the war with Germany. Uh, now there were a number of German operatives who wanted to take advantage of this because before we officially entered the war, the, we were still, you know, slipping some uh, arms to the people who would eventually become our allies in the war over in Europe. So uh, the Germans were trying to prevent that from happening and they enlisted a whole bunch of American Germans to uh, investigate, see how they could mess a little bit with our infrastructure, something that they would attempt again in World War II with less success. Uh, but there, there are a couple of narratives around the Black Tom explosion. Uh, there were a number of German spies and German American spies who were taken into custody and put on trial for blowing up the island that was full of, you know, heavy metals, gunpowder, and uh, pitch pots, which is how we lit the island. We just had fires there already. Um, but there are some people who think that the German Americans got a bad rap and that it was just a really tired guardsman who kicked over a pitch pot and then everything went haywire. But that's, that's how it goes with fires in New York. Uh, no one can really, everyone's pinning the blame on somebody else. Another thing that you can look at in my revolutionary New York tour when we talk about the Great <laughs> Fire of 1776, right. find it on Facebook. Right. Uh, but yeah so, yeah, so that's the explosion that happened. And because there were so much arms on that island, the explosion sent shrapnel flying for three miles in every direction, blasting out the ceiling at Ellis Island that had to be replaced that year in 1916 oh. and 1917 and nearly knocking the whole arm of the statue off. Wow. So that's when we decided maybe we shouldn't let unattended children go inside the statue's arm, 31 stories in the air with a like le like a one inch bar preventing them from falling to their deaths. That's what did it. Works for me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, got, I, I, gotta, I gotta run to work. Okay. Uncle great Bruce, job. These guys gonna stick on. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Okay, Thank sweet. You. I gotta go to work with Bruce. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a we'll talk to you. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Hi. 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 We're also Hi. approaching the hour. Uh, so thank you everybody who joined in on I YouTube and Facebook. It was thank awesome. you. Bye bye. Uh, great job. Bye. 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 See you soon. Bye. Bye. And bye. once again, if you have any questions to those of us who are streaming, for those of us who are in the Zoom call, uh, you can reach out to me at um, 
at an email address I will provide eventually. Just, or you can message me on Facebook or message our company and they'll provide you with my contact information. Uh, I'm gonna be posting this link around places. Everyone who has uh, signed up for the call, I'm also gonna send you a whole bunch of fun links that you can go visit. Awesome. I wanna thank you everyone for joining me for this Thank hour. you. Good job. Good job. Uh, Good job. Thank you everyone. I love it. All right, and I am going